Good morning. Come on, everybody. Let's give it up for Jesus. We love you, Lord. I want to say hello to everybody, of course, uh, in every place that might be listening, all our campuses. God bless you guys. Good to have you. Can we give it up for East Coast? Come on, East Coast. Yeah. That whether you're at the Merritt Island campus right now or whether you're at the Vieira campus, a Coco campus or the Avenue Worship Center, man, we're so glad you're here and bless you in Jesus' name. We're starting a new series and it's called I Quit, but it's not going to be the kind of I quit like I give up. It's going to be a little bit different emphasis on the quitting and, and who we are surrendering to. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. You know what? You can actually quit and surrender and be stronger than before you started if you surrender to the right right one, to the right one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. We're going to have some fun with this series because there's a, I don't know about you guys, the more I thought about it, there's a lot, a lot of things I need to quit. I actually need to quit quitting. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can make a list. That was a pretty long list of, of maybe what you could come up with. I quit and then fill in the blank at the end of it there. Today we're going to do I quit complaining. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to hit a nerve there. Oh, actually, I did. It's amazing when you start doing this and looking at it. I, in fact, I could even ask the question. But before I do, let's go ahead and start by praying. Father, we love you, honor you. Thank you for your spirit who lives inside of us that brings back to us all the things that Jesus said. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive and that it is still the God-breathed word of God. So, Lord, by the power of your spirit, may you breathe on your word again today. May the spirit of God just, just plant deeply in our hearts what we need to hear. And, Lord, we need more than just hearing it. We need more than just receiving it. We need your spirit that we might live it. So, God, help us to do that, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. And somebody said... Amen. How many people here know a big complainer? How many people here are the big complainer? No, sorry, you didn't need to raise your hand. You know, some of you might be saying, well, I know I'll have something to complain about before this message is over. And you're right, you probably will, because that's just the way it works. See, people complain uh, about everything. It's really amazing to me. You can, you can make a huge list, weather, the music's too loud. Hey, for those of you that might not uh, understand everything that's going on here musically and volume-wise, we, our speakers, you can see that line array up there on each side. We had a professional come in and move them back because since we changed our stage, they'd never been moved properly, tuned the whole room, and actually our sound was really, really good today, and what sounds normally loud might not sound as loud as it used to, and what new normally was quiet, so we're adjusting, bear with us, but it would be real easy to complain about volume. And if I did a test right now, how many people here was it, was the music great? A bunch of people raised their hand. How many people was it too low? A bunch of people raised their hand. How many people thought it was too loud? A bunch of people raised their hand. If you all got together, you could fight about it. Or individually complain all on your own because we do complain about a lot of different things. You know, that, that famous thing we complain about, I don't know why it took me three minutes to get my hamburger. <laughs> and we can, we can be that way, traffic, cell phone drops a call. Uh, I believe, actually, that some people have the spiritual gift of complaining. No, it's not, real, it's not, it's not really a spiritual gift. I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I put it on Facebook. I, I, I put out a post on Facebook, and I said, uh, what do you complain about? In the first two minutes, I had six. In the first hour, I had dozens. There's literally, if you go on there and look, there, there are about 150 things that people complained about registered on Facebook, and I really like the opposites. Like one person would complain about how bad work was, the other person would complain they didn't have a job. <laughs> one person would complain about their, you know, a, a relational problem, one co person would complain they didn't have a relationship. You know, if you could get these people together, you would really, <laughs> you know, trade lives with them, sort of do the prince and the pop, pop, popper thing, and, and, and people would be happy, you know, uh, I'm lonely, you know, uh, well, you know, I'm this or that. Or, uh, this one was good. I'm too busy. And then the other one, I'm bored. Okay, could I just give you half of my stuff? You won't be bored and I won't be busy. And uh, that would be fun to make that arrangement. But the amazing thing when I, when I, I heard one that said, uh, uh, what do you hate the most? I, or what do you complain about the most? They said, I complain about people complaining on Facebook. 
Okay, I thought that was funnier than you did. I hope, I hope the 10 o'clock service is just laughing their heads off. But anyway, uh, men complain about really important things like referees. <laughs> How the football game went. You know, I mean, real life-changing stuff. We have a tendency to complain about ladies, a little bit more relationally focused, uh, people-centered type of things that they're dealing with in life. But, but uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult sometimes because uh, complaining can become an art form. When you look in the Bible, uh, complaining started really early on. In fact, the very first two people on the planet, Adam and Eve, we find that when things don't work out the way they're supposed to, and Adam and Eve uh, eat of the tree of the garden, what does Adam do? He complains to God about the woman that he gave him. God, it was the woman you gave me. The very first complaint was registered by the very first man in the very first relationship. So complaining is pretty big in the Bible. Now, I want to I define complaining real quick because you've got to understand there's a difference between complaining and statement of fact. So I don't want you going out of here and if somebody states a fact, I don't want you to stop your complaining. Because you can state a fact and not be complaining, all right? Uh, an example of statement of fact would be uh, some, you're on the phone, why are you running late? There's a lot of traffic. That is not a complaint. That is a statement of fact. But if you say there's a lot of traffic, I hate this freeway, I'm miserable driving home every day, I wish I could work somewhere else, that is a complaint. You can usually tell whether it's a complaint or statement of fact by the way it makes everybody feel. I don't want to go just by feelings, but if what they're saying makes you miserable and you are made more miserable by doing it, I got news for you, you are probably complaining. And so uh, we want to be careful that we don't judge people because they state a fact because we need to state facts, but uh, complaining is, it's never an excuse for complaining. Well, I'm just stating the facts, like for the 14th time? You know, if you go over three, baby, you're, you're in. You're complaining. That's, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm going to give you a rule. In the book of Job, which is a, a book where Job really had a lot to complain about. He, uh, I mean, he had horrible things happen to him in his life. Uh, he, he makes a statement, Job 10.1. He says, I loathe or hate my life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint. In other words, this is what he's saying. Look, he says, I hate, I hate life, and you know what? I'm not holding back anymore. I am just going to gripe and complain and let it fly. And he had a lot going on in his life, and, and I think that would be tough. You read the Bible, there are actually whole books of the Bible dedicated to complaining. The book of Lamentations, the word Lamentations comes from lament, which means complain. Ecclesiastes, Solomon, is complaining about the waste of life as we know it. There's nothing good under the sun, is what he says. And he says it over and over and over again. You can even go to the book of Psalms, and even though that is our worship, the largest book in the Bible is a book of worship. In the book of Psalms, there are very many complaints. There are a lot of complaints there. But what I noticed as I read the book of Psalms, as I've read it through the years, is that uh, uh, one thing you can do, this is totally free, something I've done in my life a couple of times, is just read the book of Psalms and, and highlight uh, something in it. Find something you want to highlight and maybe take a purple uh, colored pencil and, and highlight sing or highlight you know, shout or highlight something. And as you read it, you'll be amazed by the time you're done how many times you're going to highlight this one thing in the book of Psalms. But when I read the book of Psalms, what I found when the psalmist is complaining... He is at his most miserable point. And it isn't until he turns his complaint into praise to God. And yet I will remember him who is most high. Does his actually his mood and his attitude change unto something good and godly. So complaining is very big in the Bible. But there is one group that is more famous for complaining than any other group in the Bible. And that is the Israelites when they leave Egypt. They actually get registered as uh, uh, the most complaining, grumbling, grousing group of people on the planet. And uh, you got to understand the story a little bit, though, to understand why the complaining was so, so wrong in this case. Here we have Israel. They are slaves in a country called Egypt. 
And they are forced to build, really, they think so much, the treasure cities of the Egyptians. They're forced to build these buildings. And in their, in their oppression and in their slavery, the, the Israelites cry out to God. And they say, God, deliver us from our bondage. And the Bible says that God heard them. So what God does is God raises up a man named Moses and sends him to be a deliverer for the people of Egypt. And that's what he does. And in that process, God does 10 incredibly miraculous signs to judge the gods of Egypt, to uh, change Pharaoh's heart, to make him willing to send the Egyptians out into the wilderness with all their stuff, all their flocks, all their children. And not only that, he, he, he allowed them, he changed their hearts so much that, they, that the Israelites asked the Egyptians, look, we're going to go out and worship God, and, and I have nothing good to wear. Would you let me borrow your best clothes and, and your jewelry and, and your gold and your this and your that? And the Egyptians said, sure, take it all. And in the process of doing this, when they, when they leave and, and, and the Egyptians find out and they go to pursue them, God splits a sea and they walk across on dry ground. And when the Egyptian armies try to come and kill them, God floods the sea back and destroys the Egyptian army. I mean, the, the story of deliverance and protection and provision, he, he, they, they, he feeds them every day. He has food there for them, except one day a week, he has so much food come the day before, they don't even have to go get food on the seventh day. They have water that's available to them in the Negev. When you think about the desert that they walk through, I, I've been there, I've, I've driven through it in a tour bus, and, and when you look at it, you wonder, how in the world did anybody, not only is it, is it dry, but it's dry and very rocky, difficult terrain. And there were two and a half, listen to this number, two and a half to three million people. And God brought them out of Egypt to, to the Jordan River to enter into the, into the promised land he provided for them. And it may be the greatest story of protection, provision, and providence of God the world has ever seen. And what did they do after all that? They complained. Again and again and again and again. Exodus chapter 16, verse 2, says, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you've brought us out in this wilderness to kill us to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And when they complained, what did God do? He blessed them. And when they complained, what did God do? He blessed them. And when they complained, what did God do? He blessed them. And he blessed them and he blessed them until on the tenth time they complained, God said, Enough. That's what it says in Numbers 14, verse 22. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. And, and you could go through the things they complained about. They complained about, just real quickly, they complained about Moses delivering them because it got worse with Pharaoh at first. They complained about Moses trying to help them and said, leave us alone. They complained about the water being bitter. They complained about no food. They complained about no water. They complained that Moses, Moses, Moses had deserted them. Remember when we went up on the mountain to get the, the tablets, the, the Ten Commandments? So they built that little golden calf thing. They complained about food again. They complained about Moses' leadership. They complained about the giants in the promised land. That's when God said, you've tested me ten times. They complained about Moses' leadership again. They complained that Moses... See, when, when Korah and the company complained about Moses' leadership, the earth opened up and swallowed them. And then they complained and said, Moses killed these people. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how Moses unzipped the earth. I mean, their complaints were not even rational. They complained that Moses killed their leaders. They complained that there was no water again. That's when Moses strike the rock. They complained about no food, no water. And then they complained about the manna from heaven, and God gave them quails. Come on. 
This list of complaints was almost as long as my Facebook list about what people complain about today. 14 times. One time God, excuse me, one time Moses was complaining to God about how the children of Israel were complaining to him. Do you see a trend here? It's an amazing uh, testimony of complaining. Here's the deal. Here's the bottom line. If you want to be divisive, if you want to, listen to this, if you want to hurt the heart of God, if you want to drive other people away from you, if you want to hurt yourself, you can do what everybody else does, and you can continue to complain. Or, if you want to have a life that truly honors God, and you want to become more Christ-like, you know what? I think you could say this with me. Do we have that slide? I quit complaining. Do we have that? Maybe. Maybe not. Let's just say it together. We're going to say, I quit complaining. One, two, three. I quit complaining. Let's do that one more time. That sounded good. I quit complaining. Let's, let's open this up a bit because I think it's important to understand complaining and, and the cost of complaining. What does it cost you? What does it cost me when we complain? Is there a price to pay? for complaining in our lives. And I believe there is. Number one, complaining grieves the heart of God. That's a big deal. What pleases God in the world today? What pleases God? There are many things that please God, but one of the things that doesn't please God, that grieves his heart, is complaining. It hurts the heart of God. Uh, it, 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 why? You might say, why does it? Let me, let, me, let me explain it to you this way. If you have children... And you've experienced loving for, caring for your children, helping them, uh, doing good things for them. And at the end of that, they go, my life is miserable. I'm so bored. I have nothing to do. This is da 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 You kind of feel like saying, you unthankful, ungrateful little brat. That's a human response to that. But the reason we want to respond like that hurt or angry is because we know we've tried and poured out on them blessings. And they're walking in those blessings, and yet there's no gratitude, just complaints about little things. Why does it grieve the heart of God? Because you're his kid, and he's blessed you. And when you complain, it's, it's, it's not a thankful attitude. Here's what Numbers 11.1 1 says. Now, the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp of Israel. If you get up in the morning and your grass has been burned up a little bit <laughs> around the edges, you might want to consider toning down the complaint department. Let's fill in the blank. It's our only blanks we have today, and it's, uh, the principle is about complaining is it offends the heart of God. It offends the heart of God because complaining has an effect also, not just on you and God, but it has an effect in your life, uh, and that effect is the practical. First of all, you're going to drive people away. If you're a complainer, it's like having bad breath. When you have bad breath, people go like this. Whenever you see people go you know there's a problem. But when you're a complainer, it actually has a, the power to repel people around you and kind of push them away from you. Look, look what it says in Numbers 14, verse 27. Uh, God says, how long is this going to go on? All this grumbling against me by this evil infested community? I've had my fill of complaints from these grumbling Israelites. Tell them, as I live, God's decree, here's what I'm going to do. Your corpses are going to litter the wilderness. Every one of you 20 years and older who was counted in the census, this whole generation of grumblers and grousers, not one of you will enter the land and make your home there. The firmly and solemnly promised land, except for Caleb, son of Jephthah, and Joshua, son of Nun. Why is that important? Listen to me. The very thing the Israelites started out crying out for, 
deliverance from bondage and to be free was where God was bringing them. But their complaining stopped it from happening. That to me is an incredibly sobering thought. Somebody on Facebook put this little saying, those who complain will remain. Could it be that the very thing we complain the most about because we don't like, we keep from ever being fixed because we always complain about it? You cannot continue to complain about the blesser and receive the blessing. See, most people say, I'm not complaining about God. Well, that's what, that's what the people of Israel said, too, when they complained against Moses. And God said, Moses, they didn't complain to you. They were actually complaining about me. When we complain about our lives, you know what we're saying? God, you're not doing a good enough job. Wow, it sure is quiet in this Presbyterian church. <clears throat> in the New Testament, it says in uh, James 5, 9, do not grumble. A lot of translations say do not complain against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I believe that complaining draws negative things towards us and repels the good things that God has for us. The technical term for this is confirmation bias. In other words, what's confirmation bias? In other words, if you have a bias, or if you believe something is going to be bad before you are involved in it, when you get there, everything you see, you will filter through your bias that you thought it was going to be bad anyway, and you're just going to confirm it was bad. If you have a confirmation bias that everything's going to be good, when you get there, you'll overlook all the bad things going on, and you'll just look for the good in the situation. This is a very normal sociological thing that happens, psychological thing that happens in everybody that we can have a confirmation bias. An example of that would be in a video service. We have three different campuses that we have video services and some people just have a confirmation bias against them and they think it's not gonna be good. What happens when they go? They get there and they find things that don't work for them and are wrong and they leave the place going, yep, I was right. But people who don't have a confirmation bias against the video service come in, hear the message, God ministers to them because it's the word. Lives are changed and they go home blessed and helped. Amen. Pretty simple. A, a woman is hurt by a man. She ends up with an attitude that men are jerks. What happens with that attitude is then when God wants to send her a man that's not a jerk, that is his choice for her, her confirmation bias keeps her from receiving him. And the very blessing God wants to send is not received. You know, when I first look at it, started looking at complaining, I had no idea how in depth, how real and how how maybe powerful or destructive something is, is something I'm as fond of is complaining. Doesn't it just sort of feel good to gripe sometimes? And we actually think it's going to help the situation. That's the wild part. And it never does. Never does. Now, remember that statement of fact's not wrong. If you've got a problem. Let's say as a couple, you need to talk about it, you need to bring it up, and you need to talk about it. There's nothing wrong with stating fact and getting something fixed. There is something wrong, though, to continue to complain about it until Jesus comes back and never get it fixed. In fact, I believe the more you complain about it, the less chance you have of it getting fixed. Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <clears throat> Sociologists are, 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 the more they look at this, they're, they're actually figuring something out that's pretty scary in my opinion. They're actually figuring something out. They believe 
that the more blessed people are and the more they have and the more uh, good things they experience, the more likely they are to complain. <laughs> and one sociologist thinks they, they figured out why. And what they figured out is the smaller the American family has become, the more complaining the American public has become. You say, why would that be? Well, for example, if you have one child or maybe two, you could say to your one child or maybe two, what do you guys want for dinner tonight? Ooh, I want, I want, I want, I want. If you have a family of six, you have never asked that question in your life. It's like, what do you want for dinner? And you basically started World War III, and now you got to clean it up. What, 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 what difference does that make? Okay, here's the difference. When you have a very small family, the family can conform to the needs of the children. When you have a larger family, the children must conform to the needs of the family. Say, well, what difference does that make? Well, if everybody's conforming to your needs, we end up raising entitled generations. Now, I speak as a two-child family, and my sister was eight years older than me, and I was an only child at my house, so I could have as much of an entitled attitude. Now, here's the truth. A smaller family doesn't have to be that way. It's just the tendency that we, by being unaware, move in that direction, when in fact we don't have to have the family conform to that one child, we can have the child conform to the needs of the family overall, what's best. And by doing that, you're actually going to raise a better kid. Now, nobody throw rocks at me. If you've got any problems with this, see Pastor Brian. <laughs> see, sometimes we can actually do this spiritually. See, here's the truth. God is so stinking good to us that we can end up thinking this whole thing revolves around us. And it doesn't. It revolves around him. God's so good to us that if one thing's out of place, we can gripe about it. And when we do, and here's just a clue, I believe that complaining is a clue that we've gotten ourselves from where we need to be over here and and God from where he needs to be in the center and we've moved those a little bit. Complaining is a sign we think we're at the center of what's going on in the universe today. What about me? What about me? What about me? What about the kingdom? What about the king? Sound a little Presbyterian again, you guys. Getting real quiet. Philippians uh, 2 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless. Some translations say that you may become pure. Children of God without faith in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast. How do you shine as a light? You're not a complainer or a grumbler. Holding fast uh, the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says this, yes, if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, in other words, if this is the end for me, if I'm going to die, on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. You know the truth of the matter is complaining can ruin your marriage. There was a church sign one time, this is what it said, don't let complaining kill your marriage, let the church help. See, there, there's issues in every marriage. And I don't know whether it's socks on the ground or, 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 or some way that the house was uh, taken care of. But there is no marriage on the planet that you can find that doesn't have issues. Here's the problem. When you take something, see, no matter, everyone has issues, but I'm going to say this right now. There is more good going on in that marriage than there is bad. But the problem is if you focus on the little bad thing, it becomes so big you can't see all the good. It's kind of like I learned when I was a landscaper. I had a, a, a neighborhood that I worked in in Sun Tree. They didn't allow fences, 
And so people would put up a beautiful home. They'd have a pool with a screen enclosure around it, and they wanted privacy to swim in their pool. And so they'd say, okay, we want to hire you to put a hedge around our property because we can't put a fence, but we can plant bushes. So we want to put a big hedge so we have a private yard. Now, why do you want to do that? So we can swim in our pool in privacy. I said, okay, it'll be $4,000. They say, what? That's a lot of money. This is 20, 25 years ago. That's a lot of money. I said, yeah, you know how many, it takes 400 or 300 plants to surround your whole quarter acre yard with, with bushes that will grow into a hedge someday. <laughs> I said, but I can do it for 400. How? See, if you take a bush that's 100 feet away, it only blocks out that much. But the closer you bring, or, bring it, the bigger it gets. If I put these around your screen enclosure, you'll have privacy to swim in your pool, and we'll be able to do it for $400. Which would you rather do? Do. The truth is, the small becomes huge if you focus on it and get it real close. James says this, do not grumble or complain Against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is at the door. Ephesians says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That what is good for necessary edification that may impart grace to the hearers. We need to get a handle on this. Well, I, I, I'm not exactly uh, sure on every level how to do it, but I've got an idea here. This is, anybody ever heard of a cussing jar? <laughs> you have a cussing jar, and if you cuss, you have to put a dollar in it. This is a complaining jar. So if you complain, you got to put a dollar in it. Maybe you have one of these at home. You complain, you got to put a dollar. Here's what I would say. You're not allowed to point out the other person's complaint. They've got to figure it out themselves, all right? Because that could cause a fight right there. I'm going to tell you right now. You complained again. Shut up. <laughs> so what if you complain about not having enough money and then you got to put a dollar in? Wouldn't that be fun? The other thing I'd recommend that if you do one of these, make sure it's a plastic jar so that when you get mad and throw it down, it doesn't break. All right? That's an important part of this little thing. <laughs> a rubber band helps too. This is something that guys do sometimes, but, but every time you complain, complain, have this on your wrist, somebody pray for me and go, ah, sort of wake you up to the fact in fact, I think if you count how many times you complain, you'll be really, really surprised at the number and hopefully humbled and it will encourage you to do the right thing. The other thing you might do, you might need to do is separate yourself from chronic complainers, unless you're married to one. I'm not allowed to separate over that, all right? But if, if they're just people you're hanging around, what well, I found, it is, it's, it's, it's infective, infectious. If you are around people complaining, you just feel like, I mean, just bring up the government in some setting and listen to everybody complain about them for 30 minutes where the Bible never says in it anywhere, complain for our leaders, but it does say pray. For example, when you're tempted to complain about the parking here, because I know it's hard. You guys are to be commended that in 15 minutes we turn around a service. That isn't us turning around a service. That's you. You come in here. You leave. You have to pick up your kids. You have to get in your cars. You have to get out of this parking lot while another crush of people are trying to get into this parking lot, drop off their kids. That is a job. Rather than complain about it, thank God for a full church. What about job problems? You know, oh man, these people I work with. No, thank God for your job. So that's the what. what we shouldn't complain, but why shouldn't we complain? Why should we stop so that we can become more Christ-like? Become more, become more godly. Philippians 2.14, I read it before, I'm going to read it again. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless. Some translations say pure. Most of them say pure. This is what it says. Do all things without complaining that you may become pure. There's a lot of things in life I've thought that if I stopped, it would help me become more pure. And complaining never crossed my mind before this last two weeks. Isn't that amazing? 
that your life and you can become more pure and holy by dropping complaining. Wow. It's an amazing story. Amazing picture. Lord, we need this to go beyond. Could I get my uh, flag? We need to go. Everybody get your, uh, your little white flag here. Um, we need to go beyond uh, just talking about it, maybe biting our tongue or putting a coin or a dollar in a jar. What we really need to do is not just quit, but surrender to God. So everybody get up your white flag and, and let's just do a, a surrender. I surrender to God and I quit complaining in the name of Jesus. And if you're too grown up to wave this flag, then I feel sorry for you. Anyway, moving right along. I think I just complained about that. I'm not sure. <laughs> the Israelites seem to stop complaining in the Bible after one event that was an incredible encounter. And that's when the serpents were coming in and biting them. And people were dying from venomous serpents biting them. And Moses said, uh, God said to Moses, take one of these serpents and put it on a pole like a cross and put it up in the camp of the Israelites. And when the people look at it, even the ones who were bitten and poisoned, when they look at it, they'll be saved. And that's a picture of Jesus being lifted up. In fact, this is what it says in John Chapter 3, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, say, how is a snake and the Son of Man the same thing? It's the sin thing. The serpent represented sin, and Jesus took all our sin upon it. And so when they did that, their complaints after that seemed to go, I mean, the Bible really doesn't register anything after that. What's our answer? Our answer is Jesus as well being lifted up. I think what we need to do, we need to choose to be thankful and rejoice instead of Amen. complain. Amen. You might try using uh, the but God principle. See, you can start baby steps. Lord, I hate this traffic, but I want to thank you for my job. See, you can catch yourself when you catch yourself going, man, I'm just so tired of, uh, but I'm sure grateful, Jesus. Do the but God thing to try to get the gears going in the right direction. Real important. Listen to what Paul said on, on the rejoicing principle. Back to that Philippians 2. It says, yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, in other words, if I'm going to die on the sacrifice and service of your faith, helping you, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you be glad and rejoice. He says, look, I'm going to die. Let's rejoice. How could a guy have that kind of attitude? Number one, he'd already died one time. He was crucified with Christ. Number two, he understood the principle that complaining dishonored his father who's taking care of him. Let me just say this. You complain about the traffic. I, I don't know about everything that's going on out there. But I believe God saves us from so many things we never knew bad that could happen in our lives. And when you're complaining about being in the left-hand lane behind somebody driving in the left-hand lane that's not going five miles an hour over the speed limit or higher, and you're complaining about that, could it be that you're being hesitated to be saved from something horrible? And can you imagine if, if, if you're like a little kid and you go to walk out between your cars and, 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 and you put out your hand, you stop your son, and your son goes, what are you touching me for again? <laughs> I can't stand this. This is horrible. I want to get over there. Leave me alone. You're kind of like, I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> I'm going to put you in your room for about four hours. That's how I'm going to leave you alone. And when God's saying, oh, heard this one recently going through a school zone. I just can't stand this school zone. It's so long. Well, instead of complaining about a long school zone, pray for those kids. Yeah. Just think which, which would please God more. See, there's just a whole attitude that if we get this, we, we sing about it. You're a good, good father. Well, if you believe that. <laughs> 
then rejoice with your life. I could, I could stay on this forever. Earlier, earlier in the message, I said that uh, God bringing two and a half, three million people out of Egypt to the promised land through, through, the, through one of the most harshest deserts in the world may be the greatest testimony of protection and provision uh, of God's hand in, that the world has ever known. But you know what? I think there's one that's greater. I don't know how many Christians there are in the world today. If there are a billion that God has brought from, from sin to, to heaven uh, in days gone by, and if there's a billion in the earth today or 500 million, I don't know what the number is. But I know this, that our God is our provider and our protector. And he's bringing us from point A to point B with blessing and grace and love and provision in the most incredible ways the world has ever seen. And we have no room to complain about that process. To drive this home a little bit further, and this is in closing, two things. If praise shuts the mouth of the avenger, the devil, the Bible says that, that the praises of the children, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, uh, they still the enemy and the avenger. If praise is the voice of heaven that stills the enemy and the avenger, what is, whose voice is complaining and what does it do? It may be the voice of hell. And it may loose things we don't ever want to loose. In, uh, in Syria, this past, in the past 30 days, many things have happened. One of the things in Syria that's happened is a group of ISIS... Uh, terrorists took 11 Christians prisoner in one town in Syria. The oldest was 51, the youngest was 12. The 12 year old was the 51 year old son. They tortured these Christians because they said to them, did you convert from Islam to become Christians? Yes, we did. Will you convert from Christianity back to Islam? No, we won't. They were tortured. The boy was tortured in front of his father and then crucified in front of his father and left to hang on a cross for two days. Two of the girls were raped. And while they were raped, they sang praises to God and prayed, which made their attackers even more furious. These 11 were killed for their faith, tortured, all of them crucified and put on crosses. And what came out of their mouth? Honoring God, praising God, loving God. And I'm upset about a hamburger that comes three minutes late. I surrender God. 